So I want to welcome you to Vertical Church Milwaukee's first online service, and hopefully this is not uh, the first of many. But uh, yeah, so this week we are not meeting together, um, but we still wanted to continue to worship together and open up God's Word together. And so uh, we hope that you uh, are finding yourself well this Sunday morning and that you are able to, even as we're apart, still be able to gather in the spirit of the church and uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we are going to continue in our Luke series. Uh, we're in a section of Luke that we're calling the unveiling of the Messiah. Um, as Luke is continuing to show us who Jesus is. He's unveiling the Messiah. And um, this passage was the next passage in the book. And it actually fits perfectly to what we have been kind of experiencing in the last couple of days and weeks. And so if you want to open up to Luke chapter 7, it will start in verse 1. But, you know, it's been an interesting week. And, um, you know, as you have watched the news, as you've talked to people, as things have come out about the coronavirus and all the shutdowns and this and that, and, and everything that goes along with the coronavirus, not just the virus itself, but... Um, you know, a lot of our supply and demand is being interrupted and, you know, stock markets and this and that. And it's it's been an interesting time. And, you know, there have been times this week where I felt very overwhelmed, you know, talking about possibly having to cancel church and trying to make decisions like that and having conversations with different people. Like, I felt overwhelmed. I've um, at times felt a sense of fear, you know, when our life gets disrupted, it's there's been a sense of fear and um, even chaos, you know. And when you look at some of the pictures from Walmart or any grocery store that you go to, it's it's been chaos. And, you know, when things get like this, our life becomes destabilized. It becomes destabilized. And there are, and when there is a great amount of unknown our life starts to crumble. Why? Because our foundation is crumbled. When the things that we've trusted in for a long time get disrupted, when we don't know the future, when uh, there's chaos going around us, you know, it is very destabilizing and it knocks us off our foundation. And, and you know, we can't stand on that foundation. We're in trouble. And so during a season like this, we want to make sure that we can stand on the foundation of Jesus. Just like we were talking about last week when we talked about the guy who was digging down deep to lay the foundation on that rock, that rock who is Jesus. And, and during a week like this and a season like this, we need to be reminded of that. And the, the church shouldn't lose its foundation. You know, when seasons like this come, we should be the most stable people um, because we understand that God has this all under control. You know, and we want to continue to love our neighbor. You know, we want to make sure you know, we're doing the things that the government asks us to do and we want to make sure that we're being as healthy as possible and being as wise as possible and caring for our neighbors and caring for those around us. But it, it also means that we know the facts. You know, we are working hard at understanding what is happening. You know, we want to be able, just because we have Jesus doesn't mean we just ignore what other people are telling us. You know, we want to make sure, you know, we know what coronavirus is and we know, uh, you know, the protocols and, uh, you know, we get our information from good resources. Why? So that when we have conversations with people, we can put it in a proper context. You know, we want to be able to give people and understanding and be able to talk knowledgeably of what's going on. And we, we want to be able to do those things. We want, to, we want to listen to our government and we want to do what they're telling us to do. We want to understand the situation and, and know and be smart about our knowledge of the different circumstances. But we also need to be confident that God is in control. We need to be confident that Jesus is our foundation and that heaven is coming and that even in a time like this, uh, we can live in a sense of confidence. But we do that by having Jesus as our foundation. We do that by 
standing on that rock. And um, this morning, you know, we are going to open up in Luke 7, and we see two different stories of Jesus displaying himself, showing himself to his disciples and to those who are following them and to another crowd of people. And as we watch how Jesus is displaying himself, we can learn things about Jesus. And we can learn things that allow us to continue to stand firm, you know, and we need to stand on the foundation of Jesus. That's our big idea this morning, is that we need to stand on the foundation of Jesus. Now, I'm going to be uh, putting things up on the bottom here. I'm going to have to type it in and out as we're going, uh, but hopefully that's helpful. If you hear me clicking on the keyboard, that is why. Um, but let's start the, this morning in this passage. I'm going to just start reading the first part. And we pick up uh, in Luke chapter 7, right after Jesus just got done preaching the Sermon on the Plain. Not the Sermon on the Mount. They're probably, they're, they're close, but I don't think they're the same thing. But now Jesus is coming down off of that, and he is coming into Capernaum. And we um, pick up the story right here. In starting in verse 1, it says, after he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of people of the people, he entered Capernaum. He entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick, and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they placed him. With or they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him. He loves our nation, and he is the one who built our synagogue. And Jesus went with them when he was not far from their house. The centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you. But say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this. And he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. So that's our first uh, section of passage. I'm going to put down my I'm write a point down on here so that you guys can kind of see it. But the first thing that we need to understand to make sure that we are uh, the first thing that we need to make sure that we are doing to, to have Jesus as our foundation is that we need to understand that Jesus works through faith. Jesus works through, um, oh man, what's going on here? My, my stuff is all getting messed up. Jesus works, right by the end of this message, I'll have this all figured out. Jesus works through Faith. Now, you know, as you look at this kind of passage, Jesus is coming in into Capernaum, and he's he's moving locations, and um, uh, Jesus, as he comes in this town, comes into contact with a centurion. Now, a centurion was a uh, Roman general. It was somebody, you know, or a Roman. You know, he he led. Uh, part of the Roman army. He was stationed in Capernaum. A lot of times they were there to keep the peace, uh, especially like in their time, they would uh, help, you know, keep peace in Romans and the Jews and a lot of kind of stuff like that. And, and, um, but this guy, what it meant was he's a Gentile. He, he's, he's not a Jewish person and he actually doesn't belong to the house of Israel, but he, he is in this story and held kind of in high esteem. Now, now, the centurion, he was there, and he had a servant that he valued a lot. And um, that servant was sick to the point of death. And when the centurion heard that Jesus was coming in or that he had come into the city, he had heard about, you know, about all the things that Jesus had been doing, um, the works and the miracles. You know, Jesus had, or, you know, Luke's been telling us all these different stories about Jesus. He's been revealing you know, that Jesus is the Messiah. People are starting to understand that Jesus has a very special kind of power 
And the centurion knew that, he heard that, and so he sends a delegation on behalf of him. He sends a group of Jewish leaders, and so they go to Jesus, and it says that they start to plead with Jesus. Now that word plead, um, it doesn't mean like just ask once, very simply, but it means a continual asking. You know, like when one of our kids or somebody wants something and they continue and continue and continue and continue with the, uh, uh, not stopping until I get the answer that I want. These um, Jews were pleading with Jesus to listen to this guy. And it says that they were saying, for he is worthy. Now that idea of worthy there, um, it, it's the sense of like they're worthy because they've done enough good works. They've worked for the right things, and so they are worthy to get what they have asked. And they're saying that this centurion, he's, he's worthy of the works of Jesus. And they then kind of go on to explain why. And it says, for he, the centurion, loves our nation. Talking about the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. He, you know, there were a lot of centurions at the time who probably didn't, and the Jews fought with him constantly. And they're saying, no, this guy loves our nation. But not only that, but says he built our synagogue. He built our synagogue, our place of worship. He built it for us, whether that meant out of his own pocket or that he okayed it and gave some of the funds for it. We don't really know, but he was a big part of seeing their synagogue built. And so these Jews are pleading on his behalf, you know, asking Jesus, listen, do what this guy asks. Why? Because he's worthy. He's done these things. He's worthy for you to heal him. Or not heal him, but heal his uh, servant. And, you know, Jesus goes with them. But what they were saying basically was, you know, Jesus, you're healing all these people. This centurion has done far more for us, so you should do this. He's more worthy than a lot of these other people you've already helped, so you should go with us. And so he does. Jesus goes with, uh, he goes with the Jewish leaders, and they start heading over to the uh, centurion's house. But uh, as they're getting close to the house, the centurion then sends out a friend, and he greets Jesus. And as they're on their way, you know, the, the friend speaks on behalf of the centurion, and he says, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy. For I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Okay, this is the ex actually the exact opposite of what the Jewish leaders just said. And this, this it's actually two different types of worthy. It's two different types of word. And this one is more along the lines of like, I, I'm unholy. I uh, don't have enough worth to be in the same house as you. I am unworthy of such an honor. Uh, and he realized that Jesus really was sent by God. I don't think he probably fully realized who Jesus was. Um, but it's starting to be understood that. And he knew that Jesus was sent by God and he was something special. And the centurion did not, being a Gentile and not a follower, um, of Israel that he, he understood he wasn't worthy. And it's the exact opposite of, of what the Jewish leader said. But then he says, and he, he tells to Jesus how, you know, kind of then he gives it Jesus an understanding of, of how and why he believes in Jesus. And he says, therefore, I do not presume for you to come, but say the word. Okay, the centurion knew that Jesus could just heal his servant at any time. He didn't have to be presently there. Just say the word. And he says, you know, verse 8, For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. Um, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. And what he is saying to Jesus is, listen, I understand you are a person with authority. Why? Because I have some authority too. 
You know, I'm a, I'm a centurion. I have people who are over me, who I come under. They're my authority. And then I have people who are under me, who do as I say. And he was explaining, can I understand the line and chain of authority? And that Jesus, I understand you come from somebody higher. You come from God. But when you speak that authority, it happens. It acts. It works. And so all you have to do is speak a word and my servant will be healed. I get that, Jesus. I understand that. And Jesus' response is crazy. And Jesus says, and when Jesus heard these things, verse 9, he marveled at them. Jesus was marveling at this guy's faith. At this guy's faith. And he tells the people of Israel, he says, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. You see, Jesus acted, and you know, then Jesus sends the guy home, and when they go back, the servant's already healed without even, Jesus not even saying a word. He just says, go back, and, or, or he doesn't even say go back. They go, they go back, and, and the servant's healed, uh, and we don't know exactly what Jesus did and didn't do, but we know the servant was healed. And the servant was healed not because this guy was worthy. Not because he built some synagogues or had a love for the Jewish people. But because of his faith. And you see, you know, we need to remember that you know, God doesn't work through our worthiness. God doesn't work through our earthly deeds. It doesn't matter how much we have done or have not done. But what matters is our faith in Jesus. And Jesus works through that. And a lot of times, you know, when we look at what's going on around us and see just you know, the state of our culture and the state of our world and even this whole corona stuff, it's like, man, I, I, I don't know how to handle this. I don't have the worth to do this. I don't have the abilities to do this. Um, or we try a lot and it doesn't happen. It doesn't. And it's like, man, I don't, I don't know how to make sense of all of this. But you know the best thing for us to do? is to have faith in Jesus. To put our faith in the work of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus, one, created all things. He is from God and He is God. But not only did He create all things, but after we sinned against God, He came down and died in our place and, and took our penalty so that we could live in relationship with Him. He paid for our sin and died on the cross and then rose from the grave so that we can have heaven awaiting for us. See, Jesus did all of the work that we already need to do. But what we need to do is have faith in Jesus. And it starts with that first time to believe that we're sinners and that we need Jesus to save us. But from that moment on, the rest of our life is a life of faith. Where we are trusting Jesus to get us through situations. We're trusting Jesus is bigger than current situations. And what happens a lot of times in our life is we put our faith in a lot of different things. We put our faith in our government. In our, you know, in our, our system of, you know, our hospital system or our, our system of insurance or our job and, or the lifestyle that we want and or our family or people around us. We put our faith in all of these things and then they start to crumble and fall apart and uh, all of a sudden one gets taken away and then the next gets shaken up and then the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and you know what's happening is our foundation is crumbling and crumbling and bigger cracks and bigger cracks and all of a sudden it just explodes and we fall apart. Why? Because our foundation wasn't on Jesus. Our foundation, or because we weren't on the foundation of Jesus, we were on something completely else. And if we're going to put our foundation or have Jesus as our foundation, we do that by putting our faith in Jesus, by trusting in Jesus in the hardest circumstances. And even when it doesn't make a lot of sense, we say, Jesus, I know you're good. I know you love us. I'm going to trust what you say. And even though it feels like things are falling apart, I'm going to trust you because you are God and you have authority that none of us have. And so, if we're going to see God work, it's not going to be because of our worthiness. If we're, you know, if we're going to thrive through these times, it's going to not going to be because we do all of these good things. It's going to be because we trust in Jesus. We understand that Jesus works through faith. 
And then the second thing that we see uh, is that Jesus works because, I'll write this down, because of his compassion. Jesus works, I'm gonna make sure I spell it right. If I was really good, I'd know how to do this without doing it live. But Jesus works because of his compassion. Okay, we have the next story. So it goes in from the story of the centurion to uh, the story of the widow. And pick up at verse 11, it says, Soon afterwards he went to a town called Nam. And his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out. The only son of his mother... And she was a widow, and considerable, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said to her, Do not weep. And then he came up and touched the briar, and, and the, the bearer stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. You see, so the second story, so the first story is Jesus is healing the servant and uh, you know Jesus works and Jesus is showing off his power through uh, the centurion's faith in him. But here we see Jesus work because of his compassion. Because of his compassion. So Jesus comes into this town and his disciples and his followers are with him and they're watching him and they come in into contact with um, this funeral procession, okay? And they were, the you know, funerals were a big deal back then. They were a lot of times lasted f for a long time and they were bringing the body out to be buried. And so, you know, the mother was there and a lot of times, you know, friends and family, if she had any, and then they would hire professional mourners to go with this. And so they... Um, we're doing that. They're in the process of that. And the Bible tells us that she was a, a widow, that she no longer had a husband, that this was her only son. And, you know, in biblical times, uh, it was a really hard for a widow to fend for herself. That's why, you, you know, you needed a husband or sons who would take care of you. And if you didn't have that, it was really difficult. That's what the Bible talks about caring for the widows often because they were some of the uh, most vulnerable people in biblical times. And so when you lost your husband and all your sons, you were in big trouble. And so, you know, as this mother is taking out her last son or her only son or whatever it was, um, you know, you could just imagine the turmoil going on inside of her. She lost her husband. She lost her son. Uh, and now she doesn't know what's coming. And, you know, it probably feels like her life is falling apart. But Jesus comes and he sees all of this happening. And they're, they're walking in and they're walking out. And Jesus sees this and he's drawn to this woman. And he sees this woman and he understands her current situation. And he understands her turmoil. And says she had, or that he has compassion on her. And he has compassion on her. And he comes up to her and he, and he affirms her. He tells her, do not weep. Why? Because Jesus was going to take action on her behalf. And you know, we see that then Jesus goes and he stops the funeral procession. Not profession. Whatever. The funeral walking through. And they stop the briar. And you know, Jesus commands this guy. And he gets up and he's, he becomes back alive. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But... Um, one of the things that we do need to understand is that, that, though, that Jesus, in this situation, he, he worked because of his compassion. Because he cared for this woman. And, um, you know, and that Jesus is a compassionate God. And, you know, there are a lot of times we need to be reminded of that, especially in a, in a, in a season like this where, you know, we are seeing a lot of destruction and turmoil, and it's hard to... You know, be able to kind of process through these things. We have to remember that that Jesus is compassionate, and that Jesus does look out for the least of these, and for the lost, and for the broken. And you know, we see a picture of this throughout all of the Bible of God caring for the broken, God caring for the least of these, God caring for the lost, and uh, and He does that because He wants people. To come to him who are broken, who need him. He's a compassionate God. You know, compassionate to the point 
where he sent his own son to die on our behalf. Even though we sinned against God himself, he didn't just leave us in his sin, or in our sin. He's never sinned. He didn't leave us in our sin. He's compassionate to the point where he sent Jesus, and Jesus is compassionate because he came. He came on our behalf. And in times like this, we have to understand that he is a compassionate God that wants to comfort us. And, you know, in these moments when we feel lost and broken, when we feel like our foundation is crumbling, Jesus doesn't want us to just pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and figure it out. No. He wants us to come before him and say, God, I'm broken. I, I need you, Lord. I need you to heal me. I need you to fix me. Lord, I am, I am in desperate need of you. And, you know, Jesus proved his compassion all the way to the cross. And, you know, when we start to understand that Jesus is a compassionate God, instead of us getting angry at God and running from God when um, times are tough, it draws us to God. When we understand that he's a loving and caring father, you know, when we understand that, that Jesus gave up far more than anything that, anything that you and I will ever, give, will ever give up, and we start to see God's compassion, just like to this woman. She was the least of these, and God, and you know, Jesus acted because he was compassionate. And he's compassionate towards her. And so we need to remember that that Jesus is a compassionate God and uh, for our own souls because in seasons like this we need a loving God and we need to remember that he's a loving God but two if we're going to comfort people we got to be able to tell people from our own heart from the work that Christ is doing in us that we believe in a compassionate and loving God and so Jesus is a compassionate and loving God and then lastly lastly Get the last point up on here. Jesus I make sure it's all right and done or else I'm being trouble. Jesus has power over life and death. And, uh, you know, as we start to kind of understand where we're trying to go with this passage or what this passage is trying to tell us, you know, it really does show us that we can have a foundation in Jesus. Why? Well, because we put our faith in Jesus. You know, we could be on the foundation of Jesus because he can be trusted. Because he doesn't work through our good works. No, he works through his works. And we just put our faith in those. And he has shown us to be faithful time and time again. So we put our faith in Jesus. And then we understand that Jesus is a compassionate God and that he works because of his compassion. And what that does is that draws us to him and that allows us to come to him. But then lastly, we have to understand that Jesus also has power over life and death. You know, and here's the thing that we need to understand is that, you know, death is one of the scariest things for everybody. It is the one reality that everybody experiences and, uh, you know, death is the greatest power that we will ever understand in this life, um, you know, outside of God himself and outside of the work and power of God. Because death is the one thing that everybody is scared of. Death is the one thing that nobody can stop. We are always trying to prolong that death. We're always trying to stay safe so we don't die. We're trying to keep other people from dying. That's part of why this whole coronavirus is a big deal, because it's killing people. It's taking life, and that is good. We should value life, but, the, but death is the ultimate enemy. And it's the one thing that none of us can escape, and nobody has ever outside of God, had the power over death, over life and death. And you see here, you know, at the end of this passage, you know, it tells us that Jesus goes up to this, this guy and he's laying on his cot or, and he's, he's dead. He's out cold. And Jesus tells the young man, arise. I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and started speaking. Now, the word arise is kind of an interesting word. Uh, it means to go from laying to sitting. 
to going kind of halfway up. And when the Bible talks about Jesus arising from the dead, it's the arise that goes from laying to standing. You know, and it's kind of the idea that this guy is not fully coming back. This guy is being raised to life, but to his old life. And he will die again. But when Jesus raises from the dead, he defeats death. It's a whole new life. But even so, Jesus tells this guy to stand up, or to sit up, not stand up, to sit up. And the guy sits up and starts talking. And all that, then Jesus takes the guy off of the cot and walks him over to his mother and gives him back to his mother. <laughs> Could you imagine that? You're in a funeral procession. And you're going down and, and you know, mom's crying because she has no other family and all these people are mourning and someone comes and knocks on the window and stops the uh, hearse and they pull it out the casket and open it up and they say, listen, get up and walk. Or get up or sit up and he sit, sits up and starts speaking. Could you, like, our minds would just be blown. That would be the craziest and greatest thing that we've ever seen in our entire life. Why? Because nobody has power over death. Nobody has power over life like God. We don't have power over death. And when this happens and when Jesus does this, he's putting his power on display for everyone to see. And you can see what they do. You know, and it says that the fear seized them all and they glorified God saying, a great prophet has risen among us. And God has visited his people. And this report about him spread the, through the whole of Judea and all of the surrounding country. And, uh, you know, so what happens is they see this and all of a sudden, and you could just imagine, like if we were there, we would act the exact same way. They were seized with fear, but then they also started worshiping God. And they were seized with fear. Why? Because they'd never seen power like this before. And this is one of the most mind-blowing things that has ever happened to them. But then they also started worshiping God. Why? Because a guy just raised from the dead and was given back to his mother because Jesus had compassion on them. And, uh, you know, and it says that, that they started glorifying God. They started worshiping God. They started praising God. And they said, a great prophet has risen from among us. And so the, you can still see they didn't fully understand who Jesus was. A, a great prophet is here. And that God has visited his people. And, you know, what they were saying was that, um, you know, God was, and God's power and presence was coming to the people of Israel through this prophet that that Jesus were that God Jesus was a prophet of God and, and God's power and God's presence was coming through this prophet and uh, to some extent they got it right and Jesus or that, that Jesus presence was there and that he was um, among the people and Jesus was a type of a prophet uh, he was you know a, a fulfillment of the, the prophet aspect of the Messiah but it wasn't just a prophet. You see, what they missed was that God himself was actually there. It wasn't just somebody sent by God. It was God. God's power was there on full display over life and death. And it was the same power that was used for Jesus to defeat death fully. Because Jesus was coming to die on the cross and take the place. Jesse, you're repeating yourself. Yeah, I am. Because it's so good. Because Christ came to take our place on the cross. To pay for our sin. To die on our behalf just like we will die because of our sin. But he didn't stay in the grave. He had the power to be resurrected. God had the power to resurrect Jesus from the dead so that he would defeat death fully. He has the power over death. And you know what that means is that when we give our life to Jesus, when we die, we don't have to fear that death. Why? Because we're going to be resurrected. We're going to be resurrected to Jesus, into Jesus' kingdom where Christ is reigning. And there will never be a coronavirus there. There will never be... Um, a life disrupted there. Why? Because it's going to be perfect. Because the, the greatest power in this world will be defeated. And that's the power of death and sin. 
And you see, Jesus has power over life and death. And the greater that we believe this, the greater that we see that power, the more it allows us to stand on the foundation of Jesus. Why? Because when we look around this broken world, and when we look around and just see things falling apart and how people's lives fall apart when things like the coronavirus comes and disrupts our life so much, um, we start to understand that, that we don't have the power to fix it. We don't have the ability to make this right. But Jesus does. Jesus does. He has the power over life. He has the power over death. He has the greatest power of all eternity and he beat the greatest enemy. So even in a season like this, we can stand on the foundation of Jesus because he's in control of it all. And I know after this life, I'm going to be in heaven because of the work of Jesus. You see, this is what allows us to stand on the foundation of Jesus. We understand that He has the power to fix the most broken. He has the power to fix death. He has the power to fix what's going on in our life. He has the power to fix what's going on in our neighbor's life. He has the power to fix what's going on in our country, in our nation, in our world. He alone is has the power. But he's also compassionate. He has the power to do it, but he's also compassionate to the broken and to the needy. And so we can go to him. He wants to love us and care for us and give us what we need, which is himself. And he does that because he's a compassionate God and we can run to him in the hardest moments. And we do that by putting our faith in Jesus. We do that by putting our faith in Jesus by trusting Jesus and saying, Jesus, I'm going to trust you during this season. And I'm going to go to your word and read your promises and read you know, the things that you've called me to do. I'm going to spend time praying and just calling out to you and spend time in your presence. I'm going to trust you to do the right things. And you see, when we do this, when we stand on the foundation of Jesus, we are stable. We have a power that we need. We have compassion that meets our soul. And we understand it's not our work, but it's the work of Jesus that we've put our faith in, and that's not going to be broken. And so if we want to be a light in a dark time, if we want to bring peace to chaos, if we want to be a light in the dark, a life in destruction, we do it by standing on the foundation of Jesus. We do it by putting our faith in Jesus and trusting Him in the situation. We do it by remembering that Jesus is a compassionate God and running to Him to fill our greatest longings. And we do it in confidence because we understand that Jesus has power over life and death and that He controls all of this. In church, that's how we're light. That's how we are st a stable, uh, stable body of people in a really unstable world. So I want to encourage you this week, you know, as you're going through your time, work hard at finding your foundation in Jesus. Whatever you are currently standing on, if it's not Jesus, it's going to crumble. If it's not Jesus, and if this last couple of weeks hasn't shown that, uh, He will continue to show that. And so step down off of whatever that foundation is, and let's step on the foundation of Jesus so that then we can be a light to a watching world. Let's pray. God, we come before you. And God, we just thank you that you are in control of all things. Lord, we just thank you that, um, Lord, that even in this time of turmoil and just kind of a season of not knowing what's next and just being destabilized, Lord, that you are stable. And God, that you are watching over us. And Lord, we just pray that um, uh, during this time, even as, as a church, we're not gathering together and we're uh, doing it in different places, Lord, that you'd be continuing to watch over our church. But God, during the season, we'd also pray that you would help us step on you for our foundation, Lord. God, that we put our faith in you. God, that we would uh, see your compassion and, and allow it to bring us running to you. And then God, lastly, that we would understand that you have power over life and death and you have the power to defeat what's ever in front of us, Lord, and that we would be able to go to you confidently. And um, so, God, we pray that you would allow us to do this. And, God, that as we do stand on you as our foundation, Lord, that it would allow us to be a light to a watching world in a difficult situation, in a difficult season. God, you are good. And we love you so much. 
Five Vertical Church, you are loved.